Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Samri. Um, I'm not sure if you've been here before or not, but uh, we're incredibly proud not just of this building, but uh, some of the amazing work that goes on here. Um, and a little bit of that uh, is, I guess, why you're here today, to, to listen to some of our researchers and not just listen, but also engage with. So when, once we get to that stage, I really do encourage you to um, be forthcoming with questions. I know all of them are really looking forward to some of the curly ones that you might throw at them, so um, don't be afraid. Uh, my name's Pete McDonald. I'm uh, with the Media and Comms Department here at Samri. Uh, before we go any further, I'd just like to acknowledge that we're all gathered here today on the lands of the Ghana people. Um, the Ghana people have a, a long-lasting connection with this land and its waterways that goes back tens of thousands of years and is still as strong today. Um, I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging and also to any people who might be from other Indigenous language groups who are joining us here today. Um, so we're here today for a, uh, for, to talk about the do's and don'ts of healthy ageing, but in the context of the Living Proof exhibition that uh, you would have walked past on your way in here. Um, the Living Proof exhibition was the brainchild of, uh, of Yuko Nakayama from uh, Bene Age Care, um, and the, the creative genii behind it was Rosa Matto, who we'll, we'll hear from shortly, um, and who uh, collected the stories of the people that are depicted in the exhibition and also Italo Vidaro, who then uh, was tasked with the not easy job of, of capturing images that, that spoke to the words that those people shared with Rosa. Um, the, the, this exhibition came about because there really is a, a, a genuine overlap in the, the culture and the ethos of Bene Aged Care and what we do here at Samri. Um, both are absolutely committed to not just prolonging life, but making sure that life is meaningful that it's celebrated and that it's comfortable and that uh, we don't just live longer, that we live better. Um, to tell us a little bit more about the exhibition before we speak to our researchers, please welcome to the stage, Rosa Matto. Thank you, Pete. Pleasure. Now, Rosa, thank you very much for joining us. Now, um, you're probably, certainly in, in my circles, but probably um, here as well, best known for uh, your amazing work in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and taking that out, I guess, as well, to, to make sure that people um, don't just eat healthy food, but they enjoy healthy food, they cook healthy mm. food. I mean, I think you, you mm. can attest to the, the real joy of, of food is in the cooking, not so much the oh. eating. Oh, dear. Coming apart there, darling. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, but I'll put that on later. You know, I'm coming. For, is that a metaphor? <laughs> <laughs> I'm falling apart. No, it, it's so true. Food is... Uh, at the essence, it is the essence of life. Um, I come from an Italian background and uh, like the Chinese, uh, our welcome is, have you eaten yet? And uh, so uh, it mangia, seems mangia. like, mangia, mangia. Uh, so it's a, a really important thing, yes, for sure. So tell us about the exhibition, how did this start? It started as a little germ in my brain maybe five years ago when I visited um, Bene, uh, the uh, Campbelltown campus, and Mr. Cavuoto, who's one of our storytellers, was making gnocchi with the residents. And there was flour everywhere, there was loud talking, there was debate about people doing it incorrectly and your family will starve to death if you cook like that. Uh, and then eventually someone sang. And when they saw me come in, they said, oh, good, you're here. You can give us a hand uh, because we're making lunch. And I, that time of utter joy when people were working together to make their lunch uh, was really something that stayed in my mind. And then, because I visit Bene sites regularly, mostly at lunchtime, um, it formed an idea in my head that with older people, even in my life, we're always talking about their past. And for an older person, that's a, a nebulous thing. You know, we're losing contact with our past sometimes. We don't live in that moment, and certainly we forget about their future. And so I said to Yuko, it would be lovely to have just a small exhibition with a couple of photos capturing, and the word, the phrase we seized upon was moments of joy. 
And so gradually, it became, because I was looking for it, we found lots of moments of joy, and I hope that that's what this exhibition captures. Thank you very much, Rosa. Mm -hmm. We won't move on. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I really do encourage you, if you haven't had a chance to have a look at the exhibition out there, um, to not just look at the amazing photography by Italo, but to read the stories that, um, that Rose has put together. Um, it's in the, she writes with incredible humility. There's no Rosa in these stories. She's just uh, spoken to these people and reflected their tales, and, and so it, it's almost like they're talking to you through this exhibition. And although they were targeting stories of joy, there's, there's some sadness there as well. There's, I mean, history is not overjoy. The present is not all full of joy, but um, there is definitely, um, there's a lot of poignancy in, in some of the, uh, the, the sadder stories that are told as well. So I really do encourage you to get out there and have a look. Um, let's move on to um, our discussion with our researchers, which as I said, I very much encourage you to get involved in. Um, please welcome to the stage first, Professor Leonie Heilbronn. Leonie is the leader of SAMRI's Obesity and Metabolism Lab. Uh, she's currently running clinical trials and investigate the impacts of um, diets, including caloric restriction, intermittent fasting, uh, time-restricted eating, um, and in particular, all of that in relation to uh, diabetes and diabetes prevention. Um, also welcome please Professor Alina Hypernan. Um Professor Hypernan is the Director of the Australian Centre for Precision Health uh, here at SAMRI. It is a UniSA group, but uh, as we do here at SAMRI, we uh, um, really are a, a nexus of all of uh, the universities and the public health system and many, many other partners. She's a um, Senior Principal Research Fellow here at SAMRI, um, recruited to the University of South Australia as Professor in Nutritional and Genetic Epidemiology in 2013. Uh, she holds appointments as Honorary Professor at the University College London and as an Adjunct Professor in Epidemiology at the University of, I'm probably going to pronounce this incorrectly, please correct me, uh, Tampere? Tampere. Tampere, in Finland. Um, she, ha has, uh, she has an interdisciplinary um, academic background with qualifications in epidemiology, medical statistics, nutrition and public health. Um, and uh, making up the, our third member of the panel is uh, Associate Professor Jill Corhey. Jill's a Senior Research Fellow with the Registry of Senior Australians here at SAMRI. Uh, she and the ROSA team have played a really significant part in the recent um, Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality um, and Safety, um, consistently publishing impactful research uh, both independently that was used by that commission, but also some research that was specifically commissioned by that research, uh, by that commission. Um, welcome to you all. Uh, I might just invite you first to just, uh, I've, I've done my best there, but give, give us a little brief lay summary of um, what, a, what a day is like in your in research land, Leonie. Uh, yeah, sure. So as um, Pete said, we do a lot of clinical trials here at SAMRI. So on any given day, uh, we'll have people coming in uh, to visit us at the clinic. Um, we may take their blood pressures, we may take some blood samples, um, but we, we put them onto generally um, onto a diet intervention to try and improve their health or to reduce their risk of diabetes um, or cardiovascular diseases. But where I mainly work, I guess, is trying to work in, in the middle age space to, to be healthy uh, as we age. So that's the goal is to have, a, a, I guess, a healthy uh, uh, period or span of life of long and good health. Um, and and um, to do that. So that is our general study. So we do different, different types of interventions with diet interventions, um, whether we manipulate when people are eating, what people are eating. Um, but yeah, the goal is to improve health, healthy aging. Yeah, so uh, I worked uh, uh, mainly with large scale databases and just staring at my computer all day long. So. It's a very welcome uh, change for me to be here and be with actual people. Um, we, um, we work a lot with genetic data and uh, large, large scale uh, population studies. So typically in our databases, there are uh, more than uh, half a million people. And all of those people, they have been very generous with their time and with their uh, information. So we have information on their genotypes. We have information on their lifestyles, on their clinical characteristics, we have blood samples from which all sorts of um, um, aspects have been measured. So that gives us really unique opportunities to look at various aspects um, um, of uh, preventive medicine. 
So I, I, I represent what we call precision health, and that's really an area where we are trying to see how we can both uh, use the information from our genes in order to get better uh, evidence for um, uh, things that we can modify. So we are, we are the study designs that we are doing are a little bit different than many others. So we are using the genetic um, uh, data um, often in a setting what you could call um, ra uh, nature's control trial. So we approximate our differences in lifestyle through our genes. We also do work where we are looking at whether for someone uh, who has a high risk of some genetic disease or, um, uh, or other type of condition, how uh, changes in their lifestyle can help alleviate that genetic risk. Because we all know that we have both good genes and bad genes and um, typically things are not all gloom or doom. So we are trying to find positive messages uh, uh, from that type of information and give people actionable strategies to overcome whatever genetic burden they may have. Thanks, Elena. Jill? Uh, thanks, Pete. So I also spend a lot of time um, staring at my computer screen. Uh, here at ROSA, uh, we have linked all of the aged care data and um, health data. So that includes hospitalisation data, medicines data, um, national death index um, for everyone that's entered aged care in Australia. So our biggest um, cohort of people is about three and a half million people. Um, and so we can really track their journey in the aged care. So as soon as they enter aged care, we can see what services they access, what services they're approved for, what medications they're on, whether they see their GP, how often they see their GP, um, hospitalizations, what are they hospitalized for? And we can really track that journey so we can um, follow that, their health and well-being across that whole um, life cycle, if you like, from entering aged care. And uh, it really gives us an opportunity to monitor the quality and safety of care um, that people, once they enter aged care, receive. Um, as Pete said, we've done a lot of work in um, the Royal Commission. Um, ROSA was actually established just before the Royal Commission um, through the vision of Steve Wesling, the um, executive director here, and Maria Inacio, um, who's the director of ROSA. Um, and so we were really well placed. We're the only linked health and age um, data, population-based data in Australia. And so we were the go-to for the Royal Commission and it was a really amazing opportunity for our whole team to be involved. I'm gonna say this once, but it applies to every single question that I ask. Um, I'm not a researcher. I'm quite stupid, really, when it comes to it. <laughs> um, so it, I might be asking stupid questions, but uh, um, just roll with it. Um, so from what I can see, one of the beauties of, of data research, particularly in the ROSA context, is that you're looking at history. So what the trends that you identify, you can actually, um, there's not that delay that you might have with a, a breakthrough in the lab. You can actually um, bring in uh, measures or, or changes in policy that, that can have an instant impact. Yeah, no, that's, that's the real beauty of what we're doing. We've got data, our most recent data is up to 2020. Um, and so we can actually see what services people access, um, what visits to the GP, medicines, and that impacts on actually their health outcomes and their wellbeing. So we've been able to, through generating that high quality evidence, um, then turn that into um, real meaningful outcomes that then can be translated into changes in clinical practice and importantly changes in policy. So we've been really involved with the, the federal government in influencing policy for aged care um, and that's also through a lot of the work we did in the uh, Royal Commission where a lot of our work was then in the final recommendations of how to improve the quality and safety care um, for people receiving aged care in Australia. Um, Leone, you, we, when we talk about your work, we talk about diet a lot. Um, diet, in your context, probably doesn't mean what a lot of people might um, think out there in uh, the average world, where we might think that you're only eating orange food or uh, whatever it is, some of the crazy Hollywood fad diets we hear about. What are the diets that you work with? Uh, so, a, a number of different ones. I mean, the Mediterranean diet, which Rosa is quite heavily involved with, which is, um, I guess, eating a fairly... Um, uh, a range of uh, fruits and vegetables, you're using olive oils, you're using, so that's monounsaturated uh, fats rather than saturated uh, fats and more using um, pulses and, and lentils and, and, and um, I 
I guess, proteins that are often a plant-based protein um, has some really great health benefits, um, as well as um, studies we're doing of caloric restriction. So that is, um, I guess, trying to eat uh, a little bit less for life. And what we know with animal studies, at least, and in and, and monkeys and, and mice and all sorts of animals, if you eat a little bit uh, less food every day for your whole life, you will live longer. So there's a quite amazing evidence as to that. So eating, a, uh, I guess, a, a healthful diet over the lifespan um, ha can increase your lifespan by, by and the healthy lifespan by, by 20 to 30 percent. Um, and it seems to be dose dependent. So if you have ate about 10 percent less um, throughout your whole life, um, then you would live 10 percent longer. So there are a number of populations in the world where this occurs. Um, the Okinawan in Japan, uh, Japanese population, are very exceptionally long lived. Um, and also there are some um, Italian, I can't remember where, <laughs> but some places in Italy that also are particularly long lived. Do you know the Sardinia, Sardinia the region? Mm -hmm. Yes, so um, they're also exceptionally long lived. Both um, of those diets also have a very healthful diet. So in, in the case of the Japanese, they have a high fish based diet. Um, and then with the case of the Italians, um, the, the olive oil um, and um, uh, pulse based diets. Um, yeah, so, so we're interested in, I guess, applying that to um, our research um, in humans. Um, there's less evidence in humans. You can't do a longevity study. You can't put somebody on a diet and wait 100 years to get your results. Um, but they have done this in, in um, rhesus macaques in the States. So they have two groups of populations of monkeys in the States and, and caloric restricted monkeys uh, live longer. Um, they have exceptionally long lives uh, as well. Um, Alina, we, we, when we, when a, the average person uh, talks about diets or, or thinks about diets, it's often related to um, fairly vacuous factors like weight loss and that sort of thing. What, what, is, what is obesity from a um, clinical research perspective? Well, um, well obesity is, um, well, um, of course, it's an excess of fat tissue, like we, like we all know. But increasingly, it's appreciated that um, not all fat tissue is the same. So traditionally, um, we've been told that the um, 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 fat tissue that is accumulating around your waistline is uh, more harmful uh, than something that is distributed more um, uh, balanced uh, over the body. And that, that appears uh, to be the case. And the approach that we have taken in our genetic studies to this is that um, we have been characterizing people based on their genes, whether whether, um, uh, and divided them in the groups who all have higher than average um, body fat, but then one group has higher body fat, but they also have higher blood pressure, they have higher low-grade inflammation, they have a higher blood sugar, and then the other uh, group has been having um, higher body fat, and, uh, but everything else is healthy with them. So they don't have diabetes, they don't have hypertension or cardiovascular disease. So um, using these type of genotypes, we have uh, been able to show that um, body fat that comes with the metabolic, harmful metabolic consequences, it's, for example, also harmful with respect to your brain health. So um, um, it, uh, and in our study, it was associated with the lower gray matter volume in the brain, whereas when you just have excess body fat that is metabolically healthy, if you like, there was, if anything, slightly light, uh, larger brain volumes. So it's, it's, it's just an indication that, um, uh, that um, you know, obesity per se, it, you know, it's fine, but it is that we need to pay attention when there comes, starts to be these kind of like metabolic abnormalities that come, come with adiposity. And we have looked at on some other things that, for example, of course, for some, some cases, all adiposity is not that good. And one of the studies that we did was looking at um, similar kind of setting and uh, effects on osteoarthritis. And there it was, because it's a mechanistic effect, it doesn't matter whether it's healthy or unhealthy, all this burden on your joints is going to be harmful. So it's all very logical, really, I think. Leonie, do we, do we need to, like when we talk about healthy eating and, and healthy lifestyle and that sort of thing, um, do you think, the public has a, a understanding of um, how important simple things can be for prevention of, of conditions that can really be life affecting? Uh, I think it's getting better. 
but I think um, it's still not entirely um, out there as, as messages that, that simply eating um, food that is, um, that is not processed, not highly processed, choosing the more um, unprocessed options in the supermarket. And that's really hard because you go to a supermarket and at the end of every aisle they will stack the shelves. They pay to get that spot into the supermarket. So your um, confectionery or your highly processed foods sit mostly at the end of every aisle. And that's where you look first. And we know from studies that people will buy things from, from that place in the supermarket. They're also cheaper. And so foods that are generally unhealthy and highly processed um, are, are cheaper. So it's more expensive to eat a really healthy diet. So there are two problems that is, 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 is against us. You know? so, so I think that's really difficult. Um, I think that we uh, yeah, need to be having a more unified message, but and even just movement, so physical movement. Um, if you can maintain activity, particularly as you age, um, and you know, my mother-in-law is a classic example, I think you know, she's had two hip replacements now, and her second one, uh, you know, we're having trouble getting her to move. And, and, and if, she, um, you know, if she loses that muscle mass, then that can really increase frailty, and that is really strongly linked to mortality, as, as you would be aware with your data sets, I'm sure. I think uh, that's a good segue, um, Jill. I think a lot of your work is not just looking at, um, at what happens within aged care, but either before aged care or potentially to delay aged care or prevent aged care. Um, can you just talk a little about that, please? Yeah, so when we, um, in our data, we actually have people, when we talk about entering the aged care system, it's when they actually first potentially could receive um, home support packages. So it's not actually just residential aged care. Um, so we can follow people when they enter, even if they just have um, a community support package, so something like a gardener. So these are people that are, are relatively healthy um, living in the community. Um, and what we're able to see that if they access certain types of services, it can actually delay the time um, that they enter into residential aged care. So things like uh, transition care, um, respite care, they can actually really um, help to delay people entering residential aged care. Obviously certain medications and appropriate management of their chronic diseases um, and again that can help to delay um, people entering residential aged care. We can see that people, um, often it's a, an acute event that actually precipitates people entering um, residential aged care such as a hospitalisation or can be just, you know, they're just getting it's really too hard for them to manage at home. So, um, you know, I think it's really important that what we're able to do is to, you know, make sure that people are receiving the best care in throughout their whole journey, not just right at that sort of end point in entering residential aged care. And through, the, you know, the past sort of decade, people that are entering residential aged care um, are quite different to maybe sort of 10 years ago. So they're they're more um, frail, if you like. They have more chronic conditions. Um, and so they're sort of more at the sort of um, severe end in terms of diseases and complexity. So they really are quite complex um, conditions that are being managed um, as, as well as that sort of transition into entering residential aged care that comes a lot of um, emotional um, burden and frustrations and that transition, especially for the family, it's a really complex time as well. So anything that we can do to alleviate that sort of um, stress and anxiety, not only for the residents, um, but for their families, and also to have fantastic care. And you know, we have to remember this is where these people are living. So it's not just we're putting them into care and you know, see you later in a couple of years. This is where people are living, this is their homes. And so it really needs to be a place of comfort and joy and happiness. And we really know that those social interactions is really important for people um, when they enter residential aged care. Phone's off, please, Rosa. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we could fill several hours talking about um, the work that Rosa, the uh, the registry has done, not Rosa, the, although we could fill several hours talking about your work also. Um, but Rosa, the registry has done um, just in the, the space of the last few years. But are you able to give us a, a really brief overview of a couple of the, uh, the profound publications that um, you and the team have achieved recently? Yeah, sure. So um, one of the big things that we've done at Rosa is because we have this vast amount of data, health data and um, aged care data, 
we've able, been able to develop a quality outcome monitoring system so we can actually measure the quality and safety of care um, that people both in home care and residential aged care receive. So it's a range of um, quality indicators. Um, there's 12 for residential aged care and 15 for home care. Um, so we can actually measure um, the quality of care that people are receiving. And importantly, we see this tool that we've developed as something that is not punitive. It's not you're bad, you're good. It's about what is it that we can learn from the data and how can we then provide that information back to aged care providers so they can improve on the quality and safety and care. And it's learning from what other aged care providers. So if you're you know, doing really well in terms of, say, medication management, well, what is it that that facility is doing um, that's really good in terms of their medication management? Why is this so good? And then it's learning from other aged care providers um, to have that quality improvement so we can actually then um, improve the quality and safety of care. So that's been a really um, big and significant piece of work that we've been doing over the quite a few years and it's one of the tools that the Royal Commission um, utilised as well so they could actually um, monitor and examine quality and safety of care. Until that point in time, it's only been in the last couple of years that um, nationally the federal government has decided it's important to also manage quality and safety of care. So um, they've got their program, it's got currently got five indicators. Um, so we really see our tool as an adjunct because it uses existing data and there's no burden on aged care providers and the residents themselves in terms of that data collection. And having using existing data collections, it comes without bias as well. So that's one of the really key things. One of our really interesting studies that we um, have done, and it was one of the things that really informed quite a few recommendations and translated into changes for both policy and practice, um, was looking at um, medication use, um, particularly psychotropic medications, um, after people enter residential aged care. And what we're able to show is that actually just before that period of time they enter residential aged care, the use of these medications such as antipsychotics or sedating medications, um, antidepressants um, or anti-anxiety medications, there's a slight increase just before they enter aged care, which you know, potentially makes sense. Um, it's a tough period of stress and you know, potentially something is going wrong in terms of how they're feeling and their well-being. Um, but importantly, what we showed is that after they enter residential aged care, it goes up even more. Um, and the problem is, is that a lot of these medications, you're only supposed to stay on them for eight weeks, 12 weeks, depending on what medication it is. And in our data, we're able to show that these people stayed on these medications for a whole year. And these medications can be associated with a whole range of um, adverse effects, side effects, increased risk of falls, uh, impaired cognitive function, and the list goes on. So through that, we were able to show this is a really vulnerable point for people in residential aged care, that first um, you know, three months, four months, and really we need to have a clinical pharmacist come in, review the medications, let's see what we can do to get these people off of these medications, um, because we really want to have um, you know, quality use of medicines and a quality of life going together after they enter residential aged care. And so, you know, that was uh, one of the recommendations um, in the final report of the Royal Commission. Um, uh, uh, postdoc who actually did that work, that paper actually got um, awarded one of the top 10 papers in um, the Medical Journal of Australia, which is Australia's leading medical journal. So it was a, just a, a small little snapshot of, um, you know, an example of what you can do and how powerful it is to actually sort of follow that journey in terms of what happens before and after they enter residential aged care. Uh, I've got more questions on my list, but uh, might throw it open to the floor. Does anyone have anything they'd like to ask our researchers? Don't be shy now. I knew you wouldn't be shy. It's my father, everyone. <laughs> um, the only... Um, I've sp I'm spending money on Omega-3 oil at the moment. I'm wondering whether there's any association between the um, level of sardines written in Sardinia and, um, <laughs> and their better health. Security. 
Look, fish oils um, do have a lot of good benefits, and Adelaide, I think, is the fish capital, <laughs> the fish oil capital of research in Australia. There's been a lot of research done here into into the health benefits of fish oils. Um, look, it, they do. Out of all of the supplements you can take, I think fish oils are probably one of the the, the better ones in terms of their their evidence for a whole range of benefits. They can reduce triglycerides, they can you know, reduce inflammation. Um, we've got some work going on here with Maria and McCready showing they can prevent preterm birth. There is, there is a lot of um, benefits to, to fish oils. Um, and so the, I mean, the one caveat I would say is that a lot of the shop, they do degrade quickly. And so the fish oils, you should look at the date when you're buying them. They give a very long, often they'll have a three year lifespan on the bottle that you buy. Um, they're expensive and they degrade. So if you're taking fish oils that are getting older, you're potentially um, are losing some of the benefits. Thank you for that. Um, the people who come to your clinic um, are f very, very fortunate in that they're getting access to leading edge um, knowledge and experience in your research um, and are benefiting substantially by that, I'm sure. How is it that your research rapidly gets to people like me and us. Um, and I'm thinking of shows like The Cook and the Chef, um, where they're really popular shows, um, but can be overlaid with knowledge of nutrition, mm. in addition to being uh, able to cook a much better meal. Uh, could you comment on that for me? That is a wonderful idea, I guess. So to add to MasterChef when they're talking about this, the health benefits of some of the, the foods what, that, you, that you're getting. And I, I think that's kind of where I was thinking of when I was saying I think that it's improving. I think these shows are changing the way that people cook. When I had people coming into our clinics, you know, 20 years ago, they would tell me, I don't know how to boil a pot of water. And, and that's changed. People are more happy to cook meals in the last, from scratch in the last 10 years, at least what I hear in the clinics than they were before shows like MasterChef. So people are learning skills about how to cook from these shows, and that's a fantastic idea, is to add that nutrition knowledge um, into that. Yeah, that, that's, that's a wonderful, wonderful idea. And, and somebody like Maggie Beer, getting Maggie Beer behind that sort of thing would be amazing. I know Maggie has been really interested in nursing homes and, and improving the health, uh, the food delivery of nursing homes and, and making it, um, as Rosa said, a whole experience. So getting them to cook along, cook a cake. If you can, if you can get the smells and, and the, the activity going, um, it's a huge problem in nursing homes, malnutrition. Um, the foods are not often uh, tasty. Um, they don't make sure that the residents are necessarily eating them. Um, and to really, you, and, and also as you age, you, you um, you lose your sensation of taste, so thing doesn't, things don't taste as good. So sometimes you have to flavour them more um, to 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 make them taste good. So so there's a number of of ways we could be, um, I guess, fixing these problems. Can I just make a little point about um, there is something called the Bene paradox. Uh, Malnutrition is a problem in many nursing homes, but we find at Bene that they actually put on weight. Yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, which becomes another problem. <laughs> but uh, I don't think it's a problem at this age. No, 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 that's <laughs> I right. I don't think we need to worry about our older people gaining weight. No. Uh, may I have two questions? And the first one is uh, fish oil. How much and what kind of fish do we need to eat? And can we replace the capsule with a meal, if you can afford it, <laughs> you can afford it. exactly. Yes, uh, ooh, uh, this is not my research area, I have to say. Um, there are, some of the krill oils are just as good in terms of, and they're more sustainable. So the krill oils um, are a more sustainable source of the fish oils, um, and so they're a good one, good one to choose, and they have all of the same, but you need to be looking for the DHA, mostly, the dehoxy, <laughs> the um, I can help answer this because I actually did uh, my PhD in biochemistry of inflammatory diseases and I worked with um, Professor Les Cleland who 30 years ago um, started the FISH oil trials for people with rheumatoid arthritis, an anti-inflammatory agent and uh, just a bit of a funny story. So often, um, so Les Cleland was uh, very passionate about FISH oil as a supplement to reduce inflammation. Um, and uh, so he would always have a bottle of fish oil 
I don't know if you've ever smelt fish oil. I don't know, it smells, it tastes even worse than it smells. And every lunch you'd go in there and he would just have a big skull out of the fish oil bottle. Um, it had that um, satiety effect, so like it made him feel full, and that's how he got his omega-3. So um, I can highly unrecommend to do it. He got me to do it a few times, so as a PhD student, I'm like, sure, I'll do it. And he got me a little shot glass, and oh, God, it was terrible. And I did fish oil burps for the, you know, 24 hours. But anyway, so, um, so luckily things have evolved a lot um, since then, and we can get the capsules. But... One of the things that you need is actually the correct dose. So depending on what it is that um, you want in terms of whether it's for cardiovascular benefits, um, so for vascular patency, um, it's a lower dose, but if you actually want it for an anti-inflammatory effect, you actually need quite a high dose. So in the olden days, it used to be nine of those fish oil capsules. They've increased the strength of the capsules now, so you need less, but it still is quite a lot. So people just think you take one or two capsules a day, um, well, you know, that's not enough for that anti-inflammatory effect if that's sort of, you know, what you're looking for. Um, and, uh, you know, I think, you know, in terms of getting fish, um, your omega-3s from fish, it's normally the deep sea fish. Um, so the things like, uh, you know, I can't remember. Um, yeah, those kind of things, sardines and um, there's a really nice one, though, that I can't remember. Anyway. Salmon, yeah, um, are really high um, in the omega-3. So the lovely whiting and garfish, they actually don't have a lot of omega-3s in them. So. And Leonie, can you talk a little bit about um, intermittent eating or fasting? Okay, so we um, have kind of morphed away from what we would call the intermittent fasting, which is the really prolonged fast um, a few times a week, into more of a daily uh, fast. So trying to eat with your circadian rhythms. So our circadian rhythms are what cause us to wake up in the morning, cortisol levels go up, uh, we, we, um, uh, we're the strongest, no, sorry, we're the fastest reaction times in the morning, in the afternoon, we're the strongest, um, and then melatonin levels come up and we fall asleep. And so our bodies, our t body temperature does this in a day. So there are thousands of hormones and markers that do this in a day. Um, and what researchers have discovered in the last five to 10 years is that eating is one of those markers that reset your clock. So sunlight is something that resets your clock. Sleep and waking can reset your clock. Um, but food can reset your clocks as well. And particularly, not your brain clock, that doesn't seem to listen to food, but the clocks that exist in a lot of your other tissues. So in your liver, in your fat tissues, in your muscles, there are clocks as well. And food really pays attention. Uh, those clocks pay attention to your food intake. So if you're eating out of cycle with those clocks, you're kind of the clocks in your head are doing one thing and the clocks in your body are doing a different thing. And that's associated with disease risk. And we know that through people who do shift work. So people who are shift workers are at a much higher risk of diabetes and heart disease than people who have never done shift work. Um, and so eating in time with our body clocks, so that's maybe saying eating, uh, stopping eating at, at 6, 7 p.m. at night and then not eating after that time period um, is good for our health. Um, and, and that is what we've been researching in the last few years. So trying to eat within a eight or 10 hour window even every day, but really staying away from that light, late night eating. And that's keeping your body clocks in line with your brain clocks and that is good for health. You mentioned sunlight there. Alina, some of your work touches on vitamin D. Can you explain uh, how your, what your work is, has to say about the impacts of vitamin D on healthy aging? Yeah, sure. Uh, so. Vitamin D has been uh, quite a bit on the media in the past 10, 15 years, and uh, it's, uh, it's somehow, sometimes it can feel really quite overwhelming, the amount of different diseases and health outcomes that uh, it's been associated with. But actually there is, um, there is good reason uh, to expect that it might have very um, broad uh, influences, and that is because there, uh, it's actually a pro-hormone, so it's not just a nutrient, it's a, it's a hormone precursor. And we have receptors for it everywhere in our body. So it's in the brain, it's heart, pancreas, um, uh, you know, you, you name a tissue, it's in all different types of immune cells. And when something is, has a receptor in the body, it does have a function. 
So that, that's kind of like one thing that I, I, I um, uh, feel kind of like speaks very um, strongly about the importance of vitamin D. But then the different question is, um, you know, what do we need to do about it or do we need to do something about it? And sometimes you see these, um, you see even bottles of vitamins that say uh, life extension pills or miracle vitamin and all sorts of, um, you know, really overselling products. Uh, and that's, um, uh, that's, that's a little bit disturbing to me. And I think that, so what we have been doing um, um, uh, recently is really to try and tap into, you know, who needs vitamin D um, uh, and who doesn't and, um, and, and when is it important. And what we have been able to show for the first time um, is that, um, you know, uh, vitamin D is important and all these different health effects, they probably are true but they're true for only a very small proportion of the population. So we again been using a genetic design where we have been able to look at how little increments in vitamin D would help if you are severely vitamin D deficient. So, and we see if you, if you are really severely vitamin D deficient and you reduce that level of deficiency a bit, your mortality risk goes down from cardiovascular diseases, cancers, respiratory uh, diseases, it also lowers your low-grade inflammation. It improves your, um, 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 or lowers your dementia risk. So with all of these benefits, you can see them. You can only see them for those people who are really deficient. So the, the, so the next thing is that who is that and where do we need to pay attention? And I think that, you know, we've been talking a lot about um, aged care. An aged care setting is a perfect example where there might really be large groups of people who actually need vitamin D. So if you don't be able, if you are not able to go out in sun um, enough to get that vitamin D synthesis and vitamin D synthesis decreases as we age. So um, if, if there is a reason to expect that you are not getting enough vitamin D from sunlight, then taking a modest dose of vitamin D supplementation is a really good idea. And by modest days, I just mean things what are kind of like generally recommended. I think for Australia, it's uh, 800 international units for people over 70. Because another other issue for controversies in vitamin D field is that, uh, you know, like when they give these miracle vitamins, sometimes the doses are far too high, even if they are not toxic. And what can happen when you take high doses, which are still not toxic, but they are too high, it can actually shut down your vitamin D system. So instead of getting the benefits, you are uh, uh, again leading to a situation which is more like the deficiency state. So it's all about kind of like taking the approach of making sure that you are not deficient, absolutely important, but then being very modest about it and going very rationally and, um, uh, and uh, moderately with that. And, and, and I think that then at that stage, you get all the benefits that you can from um, ensuring that your vitamin D status is all right. Are there any other questions from the floor? Ginny? I'd like to ask Elena, please. You mentioned, um, well, first of all, my husband has dementia, and my family has been talking about changes in lifestyle and diet to try and prevent it mm. for the, from them getting it. Mm. I just wondered what you have found that might actually help in this area. So uh, I think one of, the, one of the papers that I really, really like, and it fits really well um, about things that Leonie has been talking about, about Mediterranean diet and healthy diet. So we, uh, we did a study where we looked at um, how, um, you know, in people who have high genetic risk, and how, how does um, um, adhering to healthy lifestyle recommendations affect their dementia risk? Uh, and does it, um, and one of the key things that we wanted to find out was that does it also help those people who are unfortunate enough to have high genetic risk of dementia? And what we found there was that yes, it does help. It helps as much as everyone else. So adhering to all these kind of like healthy lifestyle um, uh, advice is beneficial even if you have high genetic risk. I mean, it might not completely offset it, but it, it dropped down the risk notably. So there's always hope and, you know, whatever genes we have, there's typically something that we can do about them. 
<laughs> so, Alina, those those healthy lifestyle recommendations, they're just the things that would be common sense, I guess, low, low red meat, low alcohol, low sugar, uh, high leafy greens, fruit and vegetables, that sort of thing. Is it, is, it, is it that simple? Yeah, it is that simple. So, and it's, a, you know, not smoking, keeping alcohol to moderation, um, keeping weight, body weight healthy, um, uh, you know. Sugar wasn't a component of that. It's because it's we've been, what we typically have been doing, we take the lifestyle guidelines um, that have been um, uh, recommended by others. So um, um, sugar is, you know, it is a component of healthy diet, but it hasn't necessarily been included in those scores. So um, and one of the things that what we also looked, which is also nice to see, is that we did, um, we did a similar study with different types of cancer as we did with dementia. And this, this is still, it hasn't been published yet, so we can't talk about it. But That's an exclusive. Yeah, yeah, this is an exclusive. But also there we, um, we noticed that um, you know, when people adhere to the um, healthy lifestyle guide, guidelines that are recommended by the World Cancer Research Fund, which is again, it, all those guidelines, you know, we may think that there's a lot of uh, controversies with the health advice that we are getting, but there really isn't that much. So when you read whatever guidelines for whatever disease prevention, typically there are the, you know, vegetable intakes, fish oils uh, or fish intakes and no smoking, healthy weight, um, uh, good physical activity. Adhering to those guidelines was able to reduce the risk of, you know, most cancers. For some of the um, some of the cancers, and I think that that was, well, that was for lung cancer and bladder cancer. There were two cancers that, once you were adhering to the healthy lifestyles, there were no excess risk by your on your genes anymore. So sometimes it can be really healthy, uh, and helpful in just getting rid of our genetic risk and. Um, in, in all cases, I think prostate cancer was a little bit different, but um, yeah, but maybe the, the maybe the lifestyle index was yeah colon 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 cancer des definitely. But so um, yeah, we can we can typically do a lot about our genetic risk. Um, thanks for bringing that up, Ginny. That um, it's an interesting point. Unfortunately, we were, were also supposed to be joined by um, another one of our researchers, um, Dr. Tim Sargent, today. Um, who, who, whose work very much does fit into that realm. He specifically works on Alzheimer's, um, but also um, uh, other dementias and, and uh, the dietary and lifestyle um, interventions that we can have to prevent and delay dementia and other conditions. Um, one of the great things that Tim has done recently, uh, his team developed a, um, a blood test for autophagy. I might um, ask you, Leonie, if you can explain yeah, what that is. I call, I it, I call it a blood test for healthy well. aging. But. I can't do it as well as Tim uh, can do. But um, so autophagy is, I, I like to think of it as like a Pac-Man. So, you know, the old arcade games where it comes along. And, and what it does is it, it chews up the damage in your cells. So it might break down some of the proteins that aren't working very well and it turns it back into the basic building blocks so that you can use them again to make new proteins. Um, and so that's autophagy. And so when you don't have a good uh, autophagic system, uh, you can lead to, um, I guess, a build up of damaged proteins that occurs in Alzheimer's and it occurs in other diseases as well. So you want to have a good autophagic system. Um, in animals, at least, caloric restriction and, and, and um, can, I guess, activate and intermittent fasting can activate these autophagic systems to help, uh, I guess, activate autophagy. We don't really know whether that occurs in humans yet. Tim has collected blood samples from our studies to see whether that occurs um, and we'll hopefully have results from that um, soon. Um, but also, um, and it's a bit more controversial, but he's doing some studies on low protein. So there's a lot of evidence that low protein diet, this is really important to avoid as you get older, you need protein. Um, to prevent frailty, but in middle age, um, eating a lower protein diet may actually be good for auto activating autophagy. Um, by low protein, I mean the kind of standard 0 0.7 grams per kilogram, which is about a 10 to 12 percent protein diet. Our current diet in Australia is about 18 percent protein, um, and for weight management, they often recommend a high protein diet. So. Um, it's quite a controversial thing at the moment, and I don't think we need to, sh I'm not sure we're there to be advocating that yet, but I think it would be interesting, and there's a lot of research going on in this area. It works for mice, 
we don't know if it works for people. So um, <laughs> we, we probably shouldn't go too far there, but Tim's doing some work uh, in our clinic um, at the moment to see whether a lower protein can diet can activate um, autophagy. Thank you. Hi. Um, I'm interested in, you've talked about the broad demographic as we age um, and, you know, that some people have particular genes that predispose them to certain illnesses. Um, could, could you bring that down to the individual level and one, you know, uh, you know people take medications, are they actually working? Are they doing anything, right? Mm -hmm. And two, how do you see this going in the future? Because it seems to me, before I'm hooked onto a medication, I would like to know whether it does anything, basically. That's an extremely relevant point, and that's really um, um, the area where what the precision health is at the moment um, um, making a difference and will make a difference. So we already know with uh, several examples that um, efficacy of medication, whether it does anything, how, what's the doses, whether it's likely to give um, us um, side effects, is likely to depend on genes. And there is an increasing number of medication gene interactions um, um, that um, uh, we are aware of and that um, uh, should and will be taken into account uh, in the future when prescribing medication. So it's a, it's a yeah, so that, that is a, um, absolutely a key issue. And uh, as a patient, I think it's always a good, uh, good idea to raise that with your treating physician to see if you can uh, get any better informed guidance on that. But I, I think that in the future, I, uh, and I don't know, Australia is not always the fastest to move in these, these type of things, but uh, there is a very strong uh, movement in the UK to um, uh, increase the um, um, uh, use of genetic information in this type of context, and I'm sure it will come here as well. Jill, you have a strong background in, in medications. Um, do you, what, what do you see from your research, or even anecdotally, is, it a, a, is medication often um, used as an easy fix, I guess, when perhaps there could be simpler lifestyle things that might address the issue? Um, you know, there are instances where um, lifestyle choices um, and cognitive behavioural therapy for people with uh, depressive illness potentially um, are recommended as first-line therapies. A lot of the, those sort of more interventional um, types of therapies they're a little bit of work, you know, it's a lot easier to take a pill and so often that is what's seen as an easier potential solution. But there's a lot of evidence for cognitive behavioural therapies as an example um, in, to reduce depressive symptoms um, and similarly for lifestyle choices for people um, with um, in the sort of early stages of diabetes as well. So there's potentially, you know, dietary things you can do then before you start on an anti-diabetic medication. And, I think, um, you know, interesting, as, as we age, we tend to accumulate conditions. And so, you know, in our data for people, um, you know, it's common to see them. I think the median number of medications they're on is about 10. Um, and so, you know, a lot of that can actually be appropriate medication use. Um, if you've got a condition like diabetes, you might be on two anti-diabetic medications. And the guidelines also recommend that you might be on two or three different types of cardiovascular medications to reduce your cardiovascular risk. So there's one, one disease and we've already got, you know, five medications that are, that are all recommended through the guidelines. Add on a couple of, you know, extra conditions and then that's when we get into sort of those medication complexities where we might have interactions or increased risk of side effects. So the more numbers of medications that you're on, um, there's an increased risk of having um, interactions between those medications. And there's also potential for interactions between the medications that you're taking for one disease that might have a, you know, a negative impact on another condition. So as, we, as I say, we accumulate the, the medications, the diseases, and there's a real um, impetus now as a deep prescribing um, to get people off those medications if they still don't have the indication for the disease. Um, a lot of the medications lose efficacy after being on them for 12 weeks. They're only supposed to be used short term and people just stay on them. So I think having a regular medication review will help that. 
And as we age, um, you know, sometimes you just don't need some of those medications that you might have been on 10 years ago. So I think it's always really important to talk to your GP, have a medication review and, you know, see what you can do. But as I say, it, it really does get harder as you sort of accumulate diseases. Um, they, they do work for a lot of instances, but as I say, it just increases that risk of potential having interactions and, and risk for side effects. We are almost out of time, unfortunately. Are there any final questions that people would like to ask before we wrap things up? Okay, you are louder than me with a microphone. Um, so flaxseed oil is a precursor um, to the oils that are in fish, in the fish oils. Um, so it's EPA, so icosapentaenoic acid and docosapentaenoic acid or something. <laughs> are they, um, and flaxseed oil is actually the precursor. So you ingest that and then that gets broken down into the EPA and the DHA. So originally 20 years ago when I was doing my PhD, we did a study looking at people taking flaxseed oil and we can actually see that um, the precursor then got broken down and incorporated into the cells as the EPA and the DHA, which is the um, fatty acids that have the anti-inflammatory and the sort of cardiovascular benefits. Um, in terms of dose, you need to take you know, quite a substantial dose of that. Um, it's a liquid form, but it's cheaper as well than the fish oil. So. And one of the other things I should say, if you actually are trying to get increased uptake of omega-3s into your diet, it's really important to decrease the intake of your omega-6s in your diet, which are the things like sunflower oil, um, because they actually compete with each other in terms of getting incorporated into your cells. So a reduced um, omega-6s, uh, but they don't have that competing risk with things like olive oil, so you're monounsaturated fats. So just a little tip there. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions? Uh, I might just put you on the spot uh, at the end here, Alina. A lot of, um, part of my role is uh, to look after the media monitoring. So whenever Samri is in the news, I get a report showing me where it's been and that sort of thing. It's usually pretty steady, but every now and again it just explodes. And I sort of, if I see the numbers have, have gone way up, it's typically because Alina has published something to do with coffee. <laughs> which is extraordinarily popular, uh, both as a drink and for people to read about. Um, we could probably, we could run several sessions about coffee, but um, are there any quick little interesting tidbits that we might want to take away about uh, how we should consume coffee? Uh, yes, I, I, I think there is. And I think that um, coffee is a nice example of, I think, precision health in action. Because um, I think all of us know about people or we know about ourselves how much we like to drink coffee or whether we don't like to drink coffee at all. And one of the things that we have shown is that um, how much coffee we drink is in part determined by our genes. And um, it is such a, and why that is, I believe it's a, such a potent regulation, regulator or